we'll, we'll get started. Uh, so again, welcome everyone. I'm Mark Crowther. I'm not Madeline Verhofsek. You should be able to tell that. Uh, I am uh, the chair of medicine. I think most of you know. Madeline is away this week and asked me if I could substitute. Uh, so this is St. Joe's Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, and uh, just a reminder that these will be occurring or occur weekly. Uh, the next chair's Grand Rounds will be the first week in uh, uh, December and Dr. Jack Hirsch is going to provide a career retrospective and then just also a note starting in January um, there's going to be city right wide rounds every single uh, week so Dr. Verhofsack and Dr. Azam are cooperating uh, to present a single set of rounds for the city rather than can, as we have now where we have two sets simultaneously so that'll be a change that you'll notice. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Ikasaka. Rick Ikasaka is the head of service of hematology he joined us here a number of years ago uh, is uh, probably most famous for having a new adjective uh, named after him, which is Ikasakian, which is to describe a week on service when it's a zoo. Uh, and so um, I've had a couple of Ikasakian weeks recently when I've been on service for hematology. So without further ado, Rick, I'll turn it over to you and I will disappear for the rest of rounds. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. I uh, try not to burn the place down, Mark. Uh, so uh, I would uh, have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Shian Ning, who will be presenting our, our St. Joe's Grand Rounds today uh, on intercept pathogen reduced platelets. She's a uh, benign hematologist that joined uh, around the same time as, as I did, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and of Hematology and Thromboembolism here at McMaster. Uh, and she also works as a co-director of operations of transfusion medicine in Hamilton and is a medical officer uh, with Canadian Blood Services. And so I think I will turn it over to her for her to tell us about all the exciting new platelet things that will be arriving uh, for us, hopefully. Great, thanks so much, Rick. Um, so as Rick has said, my, my talk today is on intercept pathogen-reduced platelets. This is the overview of the talk for today. So um, first I wanted to spend the first 15 to 20 minutes just going through current platelet products and transfusion guidelines and, and indications. And then we'll dive into pathogen inactivation technology and then uh, focus in on pathogen reduced platelets, looking at their indications and contraindications and the clinical benefits and drawbacks. So let's start with platelet products and transfusion. So um, blood in Canada is really produced and collected in two ways. Um, so the first is through whole blood collection, where the whole blood component is then separated into its individual components of red cells, platelets, and plasma. And the second way is through an apheresis machine, which can be programmed to collect either platelets and plasma or plasma alone. All the blood... Uh, components in Canada goes through something called universal leukoreduction, which is where the, uh, where, where the white cells in the, in the product are removed as much as possible by running it through a special filter. So then um, focusing in then on the, on the platelets, um, there's, there's two different types of platelet products. So the first is called pooled platelets, which is made by combining platelet units from, from four different donors. And the second is called apheresis platelets, which is made by um, really collecting platelets from one donor through apheresis. All platelet products in Canada are, suspected, are suspended in male plasma only, and this is because it's been shown to reduce the risk of transfusion-related acute lung injury or trally. <clears throat> all platelets undergo routine bacterial testing before they're issued to hospitals, and they're all stored at room temperature for up to seven days. This here is a table that just um, makes some basic comparisons between the pooled and the apheresis platelet products. Um, so you can appreciate that there's some differences here in, in the platelet volumes, in the numbers of donors for, for the components, and in the mean plasma volumes, but they're really quite comparable in terms of the platelet yield, which is a number of platelets that's actually in the bag. Um, they're both suspended in plasma from, from the male donors. Bacterial testing is performed on all of these components. And uh, again, they all have a seven day shelf life. Now you might be wondering how come when I order platelets, I don't have to order pooled or apheresis platelets. Um, and that's because for the majority of patients, these products are completely interchangeable. So when you go on to, uh, onto, onto Dovetail and you order one adult dose of platelets, the, the, the lab just sends you whatever we, we have. 
Um, however, there, there are a minority of cases where um, certain types of platelets might be preferred. Um, so apheresis might be um, preferred in settings where we want to minimize donor exposure. So such as patients who are quite young, like the neonatal population or allotransplant patients. And sometimes apheresis platelets may also be picked to provide specialized products. So in the setting of HLA match platelets, we have to get those through apheresis. And platelet transfusions for, for patients with FNAT or fetal neonatal alloamine thrombocytopenia, or in the setting of IgA deficiency patients. So um, whether, I don't know if, if, if anyone's actually seen this piece, but we do have some institutional platelet transfusion guidelines, and I'll just show you where to find them. So they're actually embedded in Dovetail. <clears throat> Um, so when you go to Dovetail and you want to order blood, you click on, you know, you might type in adult blood, um, and then you click on blood administration. And then what pops up is this little icon here, right, where you can choose, do you want to give them red cells, platelets, plasma, or fibrinogen concentrate. And when you click on those, each individual blood components embedded in the Dovetail order set are the following indications. So uh, I won't go through these in detail, but these are available for you to look at if ever you're a bit unclear as to, when, uh, as to whether or not you should be give, um, giving the patient um, blood. So these are the indications for red cell transfusion. These are the indications for platelets and for plasma. I'm not showing here the ones for FC, but they do exist. So then looking at the platelet transfusion thresholds, um, these are the general recommendations and I'll, and I'll go through these. So um, platelet transfusions should be considered if the count is less than 10 in the setting of non-immune thrombocytopenia. If the patient has ITP, then it really only makes sense to transfuse if there's life-threatening bleeding because these patients don't tend to respond well to platelet transfusions. A threshold of 20 is quite reasonable for um, prior to a procedure that's not associated with significant blood loss. Uh, less than 50 is, uh, is, is appropriate if there's major bleeding um, around the time of major surgery or prior to a procedure that's associated with significant blood loss. Less than 100 would be appropriate if it's around the time of uh, like a neural surgical procedure, if there's head trauma or CNS bleeding. And any platelet count. Um, would be potentially appropriate if there's a combination of platelet dysfunction and significant bleeding. So these are um, guidelines from the Interventional Radiology Group uh, published in 2019. And I find that this is quite useful because it, it, it provides a bit of added detail in terms of what they would consider as being low risk procedures versus high risk bleeding uh, procedures. So I won't go through this whole list, but just to highlight a few things for you. So. Every procedure on this list is what they would consider to be a low bleeding risk procedure where you would think about transfusing platelets if they're less than 20. So these are things like catheter exchanges, IVC filter placements and, and removals, lumbar punctures, paracentesis, thoracentesis, superficial abscess drainages or biopsies. Um, in terms of the high risk bleeding uh, procedures where you think about giving platelets if the count's less than 50. So these are things like solid organ ablations, biliary interventions, catheter directed thrombolysis, portal vein interventions, spine procedures. Um, okay. Um, so then how are we doing from a platelet transfusion and utilization perspective here, here in Hamilton? So this is just a very crude data poll of the pre-transfusion platelet counts prior to platelet issue from, from the lab, um, comparing data from St. Joe's here, um, here versus HHS here. And these are just the pre-transfusion platelet count ranges. So this is where a patient might have gotten a platelet if their pre-transfusion count was between 0 and 9, 10 to 49, so on and so forth. And what you can appreciate here is that at St. Joe's, the majority of our platelets are given for patients with a count of between 10 to 49, whereas at HHS, it, they are kind of more in this bracket of somewhere between, you know, as low as zero to up to about 99. Um, what you also notice, I think, you know, what I think is quite interesting is that about 15% you know, of patients at Joe's and about 17% of patients at HHS are getting platelet transfusions when their counts are uh, effectively normal. And that may be because of platelet dysfunction. We don't, we don't know. Um, without a chart review, we don't know these details, but it would be helpful to better understand the indications um, for these transfusions at higher thresholds. 
What we also know is that a recent provincial audit showed that about 40% of platelet transfusions at other hospitals did not meet approved indications. Sorry, there you go. Um, so when might you want to irradiate your platelets? So gamma irradiation of blood components um, may be important for some patients because it's in, it's inactivating re uh, residual lymphocytes um, and it's preventing a very rare but serious complication of blood transfusion called transfusion associated graft versus host disease. So the patient populations for which you should think about this for are kind of fourfold. Um, so the first would be hematology patients. So these are patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma on pure analogs and patients with aplastic anemia on therapies like ATG or anti-CD52 agents. In the transplant patient population, you would think about this with uh, in, in patients with both uh, allogeneic and autologous transplants, as well as donors and solid organ transplantation, again, if they're on an anti-CD52 agent. Among fetal and neonatal uh, patient populations, you'd, you'd uh, consider this if they're getting an intrauterine transfusion, and in certain special cases of neonatal transfusions, such as those requiring exchanges, and those who are less than four months old and with a low birth weight. And patients with congenital cardiac abnormalities should also receive irradiated blood uh, components. And lastly, in the other category, so here you're thinking about irradiation for directed donations, which are extraordinarily, extraordinarily rare now, uh, for patients requiring HLA match platelets, for patients getting what's called granulocyte transfusions, again, a very rare occurrence, and for patients really, again, on any purine analogs, on benamustine or on any CD52 agents. And how, how do you then order platelets? So we order platelets in doses. Um, so typically in most patients we're ordering one adult dose. You wanna check their vital signs prior to starting 15 minutes after you start the, the component and then at the end of the transfusion. And of course, during any transfusion reactions. You wanna make sure that you're transfusing the platelets slowly. So about 50 mils per hour for the first 15 minutes where possible. And here during that time, you're monitoring closely for signs of things like bacterial sepsis or ABO incompatibility. Um, so like uh, hemolysis. Um, and the recommended infusion time for platelets is about 60 minutes per dose with a maximum infusion time of about four hours. So all of this information here on this slide uh, anyway is, is available in Bloody Easy. So the fifth edition, which is the newest, was just released um, quite recently. And I encourage everyone here to, to download and, and, and take a look at this amazing uh, resource. Um, so in terms of count increments following platelet transfusions, um, most of us um, look at the absolute platelet count increment, or the ACI, which is just the post-transfusion platelet count subtracted by the pre-transfusion platelet count. And in the literature, um, and generally speaking, each, each single dose should increase the patient's count uh, at one hour by at least about 15 to 25. Um, sometimes we also see something called the corrected count increment, which is, uh, which is the CCI, and this effectively is like the absolute count increment or ACI, but it's taking into account things like the body surface area of the patient, as well as the platelet dose. Um, so then platelet refractiness is then defined as a condition where there's a failure to achieve unacceptable increment in platelet count following platelet transfusion on at least two occasions. When you look at the literature, there's variable definitions, but generally speaking, if the absolute count increment is less than five to 10, you should think about refractiveness. And also if the correct count increment is less than five to 7.5. Um, so platelet refractiveness occurs more commonly in critically ill and heavily transfused patients. Um, the one hour platelet count following transfusion is very, very helpful and can help distinguish between immune versus non-immune causes of platelet refractiveness, which is shown there on the table um, on, the, on the right hand of the slide. So non-immune causes such as things like fever, sepsis, infection, DRC bleeding are by far the most common cause of platelet refractiveness. And here, typically the pattern that we see is that the one hour platelet count increment after transfusion is pretty good. So you go up maybe 25, maybe 30, and then it falls steadily over the next 24 hours until it, it pretty much is low again. 
Whereas an immune causes of platelet refractoriness, so this is things like HLA antibodies, H HPA antibodies, ABO antibodies, so this is much more rare. Um, the one hour platelet count increment is, is typically quite poor. Um, and platelet transfusions are certainly not without risks. Um, so perhaps one of the most significant risks is, is that of bacterial contamination. And this is because platelets, as I mentioned before, are stored at room temperature, while the rest of our components like red cells and plasma are stored at either the fridge or in the freezer. So data from CBS shows that um, bacterial sepsis occurs in about one in 125,000 transfused platelet components over a 10-year period. And there's a number of current strategies that the um, that that they use to try to reduce this risk. So the first is something called diversion pouches, which just means that the first couple of mils of blood that they collect from a blood donor, they don't actually put it into the bag. They actually divert it to this other little pouch, and that pouch gets thrown out. And that's because if there's some skin contamination, that that first couple of mils is the most likely um, blood component to be to be contaminated. Um, and again, every single platelet at this point in time undergoes something called back T or bacterial testing, where every platelet component is cultured before it's released uh, to, to the hospitals. And of course, there's always risks of either unknown or, or emerging pathogens that we're not yet aware of or that we don't currently test for. So then this brings us to the next section of the talk, which is on pathogen inactivation technology or PIT. These are a few acronyms that I'll be using throughout the second half of the talk. Um, these won't make a ton of sense right now, probably, but as I go through, I'm gonna to explain to you what these, these terms all mean, okay? So PPPT stands for pooled platelet sorb and treated. APPT stands for apheresis platelet sorb and treated. PPPT and APPT are both types of pathogen-reduced platelets. PIT stands for pathogen inactivation technology, and PRT stands for pathogen reduction technology. They're interchangeable terms that describes the technology used to make pathogen-reduced platelets. And PASS stands for platelet additive solution, um, and I will go on to explain what that means in, 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 uh, in just a bit. Um, so as I've just mentioned, bacterial uh, contamination remains a risk following blood transfusion, particularly with platelets. Um, so what pathogen inactivation technology does is that it reduces the risk of transfusion transmitted pathogen infections and provides this additional layer of safety against different types of viruses, bacteria, protozoa parasites, and it even inactivates white blood cells, which can no longer replicate and produce cytokines in the component. So at Canadian Blood Services, Cirrus, which is the name of a company, so their intercept pathogen inactivation technology will be used to manufacture pathogen-reduced platelet components, which is a new type of platelets uh, in 2023. So amatoslin uh, is the active photoreactive compound of the Cirrus intercept pathogen inactivation system is a synthetic sorolin that's actually added to the platelet component. Um, and once it's added, what it does is that it intercalates within the nucleic acid that composes the DNA and RNA of cells, of bacteria, of viruses, and parasites. And the amatoslin becomes activated when it's exposed to UVA light, causing permanent cross-linking between those nucleic acid strands, which then leads to DNA and RNA damage and inactivate cells and pathogens which might be present in the platelet component. Any residual amatoslin at the very end of this process is removed via a, com a compound adsorption device. Um, so the toxicity of sorolin-based treatments have been fairly extensively studied in vitro, in animal studies, and in clinical trials. The residual amatoslin amount after platelet preparation is minimal and falls well below toxic thresholds. Um, so it's important to highlight here that while pathogen-reduced platelets are new to Canada, they're actually, you know, they've been used in Europe since the mid-2000s. So they've been used there for over, um, over a decade. Uh, and, and the intercept pathogen inactivation technology system itself has been commercialized for nearly 20 years with approximately you know, over 8 million intercept-treated doses of plasma and platelets that's been transfused globally. 
Um, so large multinational uh, blood safety databases have also confirmed the excellent safety profile seen in these preclinical studies. So in terms of the production of these components, so um, this, this slide um, I think may be helpful because it summarizes our existing platelet products, so the ones that you guys have been ordering for years, and the new platelet products that will be coming. So currently, uh, we have two platelet products, right? So that's the untreated or the regular pooled platelet and the untreated or regular apheresis platelet. Um, and then there's going to be three new platelet products that will be coming over the next few years uh, to hospitals. So um, these new platelet products are, um, are unique in that some of them are pathogen reduced, but all of them are stored in a combination of not just plasma, but something called platelet additive solution, which is a nutrient crystalloid solution designed to, to remove a portion of the plasma that's actually in the component. So the first type of pathogen reduced platelet that will be coming is called pooled platelet stored and treated or PPPT platelets. The second type is called apheresis platelet stored and treated or APPT platelets. Then the last type is not pathogen uh, reduced or untreated apheresis platelets, uh, and this is stored in PASI. Um, the APPT product and the untreated apheresis platelet and PAS E product, these still require Health Canada approval and are not currently available in Canada, but they, uh, but pending approvals, they should be coming soon. Um, this is just a figure that shows the production of PPPT. I won't go through the, go through this in excruciating detail, but really all that's really happening is that, you know, whole blood is collected from a blood donor. It's centrifuged into these three components of plasma uh, here, um, the Buffy coat, which contains the platelets, and then red cells. And then the Buffy coat layers from seven different donors are pooled together. And this platelet additive solution or pass is added to this compound to create this really big bag, which is then centrifuged to get rid of as much as possible the remaining red cells. It's leuco reduced to get rid of as much as possible the residual white cells, leaving products or sorry, leaving platelets. Um, and then the pathogen inactivation process occurs with the amatocylin addition, the UVA illumination, and the removal of the amatocylin, creating at the end of the day two um, single dose pooled platelets. So these PPPT platelets that are ready for, for, uh, for transfusion. Um, this is just a picture of, of a comparison of the untreated or the regular pooled platelets right now in plasma. And then the PPPT product, which is the pathogen reduced platelet. Um, and you can see there's a few differences. So, um, so I apologize because I think that the rulers are actually a bit different, but this, this PPPT product is, is actually a bit bigger than the, than the current product. And the other thing that you'll appreciate is the fact that this product is quite a bit lighter. So the PP, PPPT product is quite a bit lighter, less, less yellow than the regular untreated pool platelet. And that's because 60% um, of the plasma in this PPPT bag is, has been replaced by the crystalloid solution called PASS, um, leaving only about 40% of plasma left in the bag, uh, hence why there's a difference here in the color. So in terms of implementation uh, timeline, so when might we be seeing these types of products here in Hamilton? Um, so these products are already available in Ottawa and have been available in Ottawa since uh, January of this year. Um, so production is going to start in on the East Coast in Dartmouth starting in March of 2023 for the PPPT product. And the implementation is going to roll out across the country over the course of 2023. Um, so at some point in 2023, we'll definitely be seeing these, these new pathogen reduced platelets in Hamilton. Um, the current approved shelf life of these products, so meaning these, these platelets can be stored uh, for only five days as opposed to seven days. Um, but we anticipate that the seven day approval is likely coming through Health Canada, although that's still, um, still in the works. Okay, so what about clinical indications and, contra and contraindications and benefits and drawbacks? So what are we going to actually see in the, in the patients? So in terms of indications, um, pathogen-reduced platelets have the same indications as untreated platelets with the following additional considerations. So number one, irradiation is not required or indicated. So I went through, um, you know, it's 
slides ago about how we have to irradiate for all these different indications. Well, once we have pathogen reduced platelets, um, at least the pooled products will not need to be irradiated. And that's because the pathogen inactivation process inactivates the white cells that are left in the product. So they're considered to be equivalent to, um, to an irradiated uh, component. And these products are also considered to be CMV negative. Um, this is not, this is currently even not really a routine requirement anymore for, for transfusion. The only time that we care about a product being CMB negative, CMB negative rather, is when it's for an intrauterine transfusion, uh, which, which we don't do here, here in the, in, uh, in the Hamilton region, but it's also considered now to be CMB negative, which is, which is nice. In terms of contraindications, so they have the same contraindications as untreated or regular platelets with the following additions. So number one, they're, they're contraindicated for patients with a history of hypersensitivity reactions just to amatoslin itself or to other sorolins. And they're contraindicated for patients, for neonatal patients treated with phototherapy devices that emit, that emit this peak energy wavelength of less than 425 nanometers or have a lower bound of emission bandwidth of less than 375 nanometers. And this is due to the potential for erythema resulting from interaction between the UV light itself and the amatoslin. So um, do we care about this? Um, so, you know, I think it's important to, to highlight at this point that phototherapy um, with what's in the blue-green range of light is the current standard of care for the treatment of hyperbilirubinemia uh, in Canada. Blue-green light um, has a peak wavelength that is completely safe. It's about 450 to 460. So um, we don't anticipate seeing a problem for the for for basically this this population. Uh, but but if if there's some type of unusual contraindication, certainly for for patients with a history of allergy. Um, we will continue to offer non-pathogen reduced platelet products as needed. Um, so there's a number of benefits to um, pathogen reduced platelets versus regular platelets. So I think the first you know, important thing is the fact that it significantly reduces the, the risks of bacterial transmission following blood transfusion. So if we just look at Swiss um, blood safety or hemovigilance data um, from, from 2011 to, to 2016, this is before they implemented pathogen, in, pathogen inactivation. They, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, no, backwards. So Swiss safety data after the implementation of pathogen inactivation after 2011, there were zero cases of transfusion transmitted bacterial infections out of over 200,000 issued platelet uh, components versus 2005 to 2011, which is before the implementation of pathogen inactivation, there were 16 cases reported out of about 158,000 uh, platelets. Um, there's also uh, now no more need for routine bacterial testing before release into the inventory because it's felt that the pathogen um, um, production process is so safe that we don't need to be routinely testing platelets anymore before they're actually released, which means that hospitals then actually get these platelets about 24 hours earlier, so we're getting a fresher product. Um, beyond that, it's reducing the risks of other transfusion transmitted infections. Uh, remember, I had said that uh, amatoslin goes into the platelet uh, component and it just intercalates whatever DNA, RNA it's able to find. So uh, it's not targeting anything in particular. It's just trying to eliminate uh, whatever it's 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 um, it's there. So it's providing this additional layer of safety then against a broad range of viruses, bacteria, and protozoa and parasites. Um, keeping in mind, though, that some pathogens are still resistant to amatoslin treatment, like hepatitis A, hepatitis E, poliovirus, and prions. Um, furthermore, um, the process also inactivates white blood cells, which inhibits the replication and cytokine production. So as I've uh, mentioned before, irradiation is no longer necessary, which also simplifies the ordering process and inventory management for hospitals. And again, these products are considered to be CMV negative. From a safety profile standpoint, um, safety endpoints from clinical trials and published blood safety data shows favorable adverse transfusion reaction and safety profiles. Compared to non-pathogen reduced or untreated platelets, pathogen reduced platelets have been shown to have a to, to have fewer allergic and febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. And this is probably not surprising when you think about the fact that 
um, we are inactivating white blood cells, which are thought to be responsible for some of these reactions. One and two, we're, we're replacing a good chunk of the plasma in the product with this platelet additive solution. Um, a 2017 Cochrane review looked at, uh, again, comparing pathogen reduced platelets to untreated platelets. And what they found was that there were no differences in other clinical outcomes like thrombosis, anaphylaxis, or acute transfusion reactions, and no increases in adverse events in clinical trials. Uh, from a respiratory risk perspective, a randomized trial called the SPRINT trial, uh, which randomized about 600 patients with thrombocytopenia to either intercept or pathogen-reduced platelets or untreated platelets, suggested a possible risk of ARDS. Um, so the authors had initially uh, uh, reported that there were five cases out of 318 treated patients in the pathogen-reduced group versus zero out of 327 in the untreated group who got ARDS. Um, however, secondary analysis of the data showed really no differences. More recently, um, there's been the Piper trial, which is a post, uh, sorry, which is a phase four post-market surveillance study that evaluated transfusions in the hematology oncology patient um, group at over 15 U.S. sites, where over 2,000 patients got over 10,000 platelets. And what they found here was that there were no differences in mechanical ventilation or pulmonary injury. And there were also no differences that were detected for risks of ARDS or other adverse events. Um, Swiss blood safety data also failed to, to detect a difference. Um, again, they, they reported a risk of trally, um, about one in 30,000 for untreated platelets and about one in, um, again, 30,000 for intercept treated platelets. Um, furthermore, there's also been uh, pretty solid short-term safety and efficacy data in both the pediatric patient population and among neonates. In terms of um, clinical outcomes and drawbacks, so um, when pathogen-reduced platelets are compared to untreated platelets, there's been no differences reported in any studies in terms of mortality, any bleeding event, clinically significant bleeding, or severe bleeding. Um, studies, however, have shown that transfusions with pathogen-reduced platelets compared to untreated platelets uh, lead to lower correct count increments at 1 in 24 hours. Um, it's, it's led to an increase in the number of platelet transfusions and a shorter time interval between those platelet transfusions in some cases. Um, these differences, however, are, are, are quite small. Um, furthermore, non-immune platelet refractiveness was also more frequently observed in some of the studies. So these are four plots from the 2017 Cochrane systematic review comparing the intercept product versus the untreated platelet um, product. And it shows you uh, differences in the one hour and the 24 hour correct account increments. And you can appreciate that um, the intercept platelets have a slightly lower correct account increment compared to the untreated platelets at both one hour and 24 hours. Um, so while count increments may be a bit lower following transfusion with pathogen-reduced platelets in some settings, it's important to remember, um, as shown by the landmark PLATO trial variable platelet doses, that if more platelets are required, that's one thing, but clinical bleeding in this study where patients received low, medium, or high platelet doses was not increased with patients who got lower doses of platelets. So again, trials with pathogen-reduced platelets also did not observe an increased bleeding risk in patients. And finally, uh, in terms of neonatal, uh, neonatal and intrauterine transfusions, so there's been several papers that's described the, the use of pathogen-reduced platelets in pediatrics and neonatal populations, and so far there's been no indications of harm. The larger study um, looked at over 3,800 pediatric patients across four centers uh, over six years with over 12, uh, with almost 1,200 patients under four uh, months old without any major complications. However, there's been no long-term studies in these uh, populations. And in the setting of intrauterine transfusions, there's been no published um, data out there. So benefits and risks should be assessed and balanced before using pathogen-reduced platelets in these settings. So in conclusion, uh, pathogen-reduced platelets are coming to you or all of us in 2023. 
Uh, Pathogen-reduced platelets reduces the risk of bacterial contamination and allergic and febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. Irradiation of these products are no longer necessary. In terms of clinical outcomes, they're comparable to untreated platelet products, except they have slightly lower count increments following transfusion. Um, so I just want to point out um, a few additional resources for those of you who are interested um, that you may find helpful. So um, Canadian Blood Services has a website called sort of the professional education or pofedu.ca website, and it's a great resource for, you know, learning about transfusion and um, uh, platelets or other other blood uh, components. But on that website, there's a chapter, chapter 19, called Pathogen Reduced Platelets that goes through everything I've talked about in in uh, in a lot more detail and reviews all of the literature that surrounds these uh, these different issues. We we also have available three different slide decks, um, and these decks are all available to be downloaded. So if you wanted to read them, uh, or you can even watch them as a video. So this is coming. Um, you can also watch it instead of going through through the decks yourselves. The FAQ is also a, 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 a very helpful um, place for questions that we've received over this last year with implementation of these products throughout Canada. Um, the circular of information is, is a nice resource to look at the details of the products for anybody who's interested. Um, as is the intercept package insert. And lastly, the Ontario Regional Blood Coordinating Network, or ORPCON, has a nice information section as well on pathogen-reduced pool platelets. Um, so these are my references, and I'm happy to take, uh, take any questions. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Dr. Ning, for the great presentation, where we can open for questions. There's nothing currently in the chat or Q&A that anyone has written, uh, but we are happy to uh, have anyone chime in. Uh, although I believe that based on the Q&A, there may be an allowed to talk thing. People can. Yeah, Rick, they can open up their mics and ask. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll kick off and just ask a question. Um, uh, so she a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we, we have a platelet approval policy here at St. Joe's, and it's probably worth just reminding people of that because it causes no end of frustration to people when they want to get platelets and they can't just order them. And, and it would also be probably interesting to have people hear a little bit about your, your, when you get those calls, how frequently you actually tell the people the platelets aren't indicated, because I think that's actually a useful piece of information. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, I think yeah, that's a that's an important piece to to point out, and I think sometimes um, frustrating for people who work at both HHS and St. Joe's, where the policies are a bit different. So at HHS, if you want platelets, you just order them; they just issue them out to you. But at St. Joe's, all platelet transfusions have to go through hematology approval. I don't know about uh, you guys, Rick and Mark. I mean, I don't. I find where the conversations are helpful often is that, you know, people call me for platelets and sometimes I'm able to provide it, you know, provide an, an additional piece of advice about managing that person's hemostasis. So I don't tend to say outright no, unless the platelets are like normal or, you know, fairly adequate. But I find that, um, that hopefully that we are able to provide some additional guidance around, um, around management of a bleeding patient. Um, so, I mean, I will, you know, if I, if I really strongly feel like that platelets are not indicated, then, uh, then I will, I will try to kind of Hello? have that conversation. Hello? Oh, I think somebody might have a live mic there. Uh, I, I agree with that, Shui. I think that the, the fact that people have to call actually probably reduces questionable use. Um, and I know for sure that when I have covered HHS sites and here um, and look at platelet utilization, which I did in the past, there was a lot more utilization at the HHS. But on the other hand, they have a different group of patients who may need platelets more often. Um, I think the one thing that uh, my most frequent piece of advice when people call me about low platelets is that they haven't actually thought about why the patient has low platelets and that, you know, low platelets are not a disease in themselves, except in the case of ITP, they're a marker of another disease process and the, 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 the correction of the thrombocytopenia in the short term may be platelet transfusion, but in the long term is identifying and correcting whatever the underlying cause is. And that's probably the predominant actual value in them having to call us because we can help them to better understand what the cause of the thrombocytopenia is. Yeah. For sure. So uh, I was just going to ask, uh, is, 
Is the intent now when this is fully rolled out that this will now become the default platelet product uh, that is available in our system with you know specific exceptions in those cases that you sort of outlined above? Yeah, yeah, Rick. So um, where Canadian Blood Services is going is that uh, once the pooled platelet product is implemented uh, for pathogen reduction, they're going to move on to the apheresis product for pathogen reduction. So in the next year, maybe year and a half, um, the great majority of the platelet inventory will be completely pathogen reduced. Um, and the unpathogen reduced or the untreated platelets will, um, will make a very, very small percentage of the inventory. And those have to still undergo bacterial testing. And so it's going to take time to actually get access to those products. And those products will probably be most accessible, let's say, to patients with a storeroom allergy, which is very rare, um, or in the setting of intrauterine transfusions for which we have no clinical data. Um, so I think the centers that do intrauterine transfusions probably will continue to order untreated or non-pathogen reduced platelets at this time. Um, and so, so, so yeah, so, so the majority of their inventory will be pathogen reduced. Even on the plasma side, and I know that's not what this talk is about, but even on the plasma side, um, CBS is also moving towards uh, the use of basically some variant of pathogen reduced plasma. So we're going to start lifting restrictions on solvent detergent treated plasma, which as you know, right now require like special approvals and all this kind of stuff through CBS. But as of March of 2023, they're, li they're, they're lifting uh, that process. So anybody who wants solvent detergent plasma can order it, any hospital. Um, and the move eventually is to get to pathogen reduced plasma. Um, so these are not decisions that were made I think there were expensive decisions, but there were decisions that, that were made um, recognizing that pathogen reduction provides us with basically a safer blood component. And uh, just, just another question, because I don't think anyone else has chimed in. Yeah. Uh, so I, given that uh, you mentioned that, you know, sore and allergy, is there any point at this point before we rolled out this product, except in Ottawa, that anyone know that they have a sore limb allergy? Is there? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, not like, I've not heard of this. Um, it's not something that uh, that's been published extensively on. So we've had no issues in Ottawa. Um, there's been no real, real significant issues in all the other countries that like France, who only carry pathogen reduced platelets and have been for the last decade. Um, so there's been no significant issues outside of Canada either. So we don't anticipate this to be an issue, but it's important that, you know, like I have to mention it because it's it's on the package insert as a contraindication. Yeah. Um, maybe I can pose a question to the other folks on the call. Do people have any concerns about this product after hearing the presentation? I know sometimes people think about, oh, well, the increments are lower. Like, are people worried about that piece or are they kind of like, ah, you know, it'll be fine. If they need to, we'll just give them one extra dose of platelets. Oh, Dr. Cox said, is there a cost difference? Um, so I don't know the exact cost difference between the untreated versus the pathogen reduced platelet products. Um, but, um, my, but my understanding is that the pathogen reduced products are, are pricier because we are pathogen reducing them. Um, but the hope there is that um, after we get the seven day extension of the shelf life of these products that hopefully we'll have less platelet wastage there'll be cost savings around the bacterial transmission uh, pieces, you know, in terms of um, uh, 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 workup. Um, we don't have to do routine bacterial testing, but most importantly, it's safer for patients, right? Like, you know, the, the expectation after implementation of this is that the, the risks of bacterial transmission from, from a platelet will be significantly reduced. There are still case reports um, that's been published in the literature, but we're talking like handfuls of cases in the last uh, 15, 20 years. I just make a comment, Jerry, for that, the, the transfusion medicine is a whole different world in terms of cost expectations compared to everything else we do in medicine. It's first of all, extraordinarily expensive. And so what for us might look like large increments in cost are actually relatively small, measured against the transfusion medicine budget nationally. But secondarily, after the Creever inquiry, um, there's a very clear focus on making blood products as safe as they ca can possibly be, 
irrespective of the cost, as long as it falls in the galaxy of reality. And the fact that nations in Europe are doing this means that it is affordable. Ergo, you know, the, this will just be something which is necessarily done, as Dr. Ning just said, to ensure that we have the safest possible blood supply. The costs for transfusion medicine are actually borne centrally. They aren't borne by the hospitals, although, of course, it's a zero-sum game. So the money actually comes from our pockets and our grandchildren's pockets, ultimately. Um, but but the, the hospitals themselves don't pay for products, so this will not cost the hospital anything more. In fact, to be quite honest, it probably reduces hospital costs because anything we do to simplify the blood, blood supply and to make it safer reduces the likelihood of complications and the expense of managing complications do fall on the hospitals. So uh, if anyone wants to chime in last minute, they can send it something now, but uh, if there's nothing else, uh, then we'll bring this rounds to a close and thank uh, Dr. Ning for her presentation on uh, pathogen reduced platelets and possibly more pathogen reduced products to come. And uh, I don't know, uh, Mark, if you're aware of uh, the next uh, set of presentations uh, since Dr. Rohatsik's not here, but. Yeah, I don't know what next week's are, but they will occur at eight o'clock next morning. Madeline will be back and we'll be running them. And then, as I said, Chair's Grand Rounds are a career retrospective from Dr. Hirsch will be run the first Thursday in December. I look forward to seeing everybody there. So thanks so much, uh, Rick. I'll go ahead and maybe just end rounds um, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Bye.